with us. Thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the power of your word in our lives. Thank you. We honor you. There's none like you. How great you are. How glorious you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise God. I want to welcome every one of you to this very special program. To this minister's global classroom. I'm glad that we have an opportunity to have fellowship one with another through the word, through the Holy Ghost, and also a time to review our work and look forward in a visionary way to the things that the Lord has asked us to do around the world. I want us to do another song of praise just so we can thank the Lord for his love. Just talk to the Lord and thank him for the grace that he has given you. Thank him for his grace in your life. Oh, 
God. You may be seated. Thank you very much. You know, one of the prayers that Jesus prayed to the Father was that we all will be one. He prayed for the unity of his church. Um, that's so important to God. The unity of the church is important to God. And so we have to strive for it. We have to strive for it. We have to make efforts to be a united body of Christ. We have to make the effort because from his word, we can see that that's his desire. And whatever would derail such godly desire, we must repel, we must reject. So have that in your hearts, that the unity of the body of Christ, his church, is very, very important. And every one of us must strive, strive towards it, strive towards it, and encourage it. So we're grateful for the opportunity that this platform gives us to be able to fellowship like this and share with one another. I want to especially thank the leaders of the National School of Ministry, the committee leaders and the chairman, Pastor Andrew Mutunduro. Thank you all very much. And special thanks to all the cell leaders Thank you all for an amazing work that you're doing, the various group leaders. Thank you so, so much for caring for God's people. You know, you think about it, the ministers care for God's people. So who cares for the ministers? See, it's got to be the ministers themselves. It's got to come from them. It's got to be the ministers who will care for other ministers. He encourages us to pray one for another. To look out for one another. Look out for the good of one another. 
So these are things that we must strive to. So I, I thank you for your work and also special thanks to the director of the National School of Ministry, Pastor Diola Phillips. Thank you so much for your work and your amazing staff. Thank you. This session is just the opening for a series of sessions that we're going to have going all the way till tomorrow night, during which period we'll, we'll be listening to several ministers of the gospel share with us, share the word of God with us, share testimonies with us. So far, we have listened to several, including those who are here on the stage with me. And by the way, thank you so much for what you shared. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was so inspiring. I'm going to explain a few things. We also do have um, lots of questions. There's a lot of them. Uh, so I've got, I've got uh, Bishop Thomas Raki on standby. So he's going to be answering questions. And also Pastor Razvan Mialescu. So they're standing by so that I can pass some of the questions to them. So there are lots of questions. We will um, make some efforts to answer some of them today and then um, several others tomorrow. Um, Pastor Benny Hinn will also be joining us. And so some of the questions will be posed to him. So, but before we go into the session for questions, the segment rather, for questions, I want to discuss a few thoughts with you on ministry. You know, there the are many things we can say about ministry, but the very fact that this is a, a minister's classroom. Now, of course, when we say classroom, we're talking about um, quite a, a large number of people. I, I was informed earlier on that you have already about 4 million classrooms, 4 million sets with several people logged into that. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, last year, we had a, a hundred and sixty plus million ministers of the gospel all over the world who joined us for the global classroom. And this year, we're having over 200 million, right? 200 million ministers of the gospel. That's amazing. By tomorrow, we'll give you um, the, the figures of the participation all over the world. So it makes sense that we're discussing ministry, the ministry of the gospel the ministry of the gospel. But it begins, ministry begins with the message. It begins with the message. Think about it. Jesus said, God sent him. Sent him to do what? First, he had to take a message to the world. The first thing was not to die. See? 
Hindus come into the world and die. The first thing was to bring us a message from God. And that's exactly what the Bible says. I'm going to read to you. Um, let's take three portions of the Bible. The first one in Matthew's Gospel. They're, they're related. They're related, but I just want you to observe something. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 4 and verse number 23, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. He went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. What was he teaching about? What was he preaching about? It says the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What's that? Authenticating his message. Proving his message of the kingdom. With the healings, with the miracles. Now go to the same book, chapter 9 and verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Very much like what we just read in chapter 4. But it's not a repetition. Just telling us what he was about doing. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Remarkable. Remarkable indeed. Now let's read the third one. St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And I'm reading to you from verse 14. Now, that this is a, a minister's classroom. Now, of course, when we say classroom, we're talking about um, quite a, a large number of people. 
I, I was informed earlier on that you have already about 4 million classrooms, 4 million sets with several people logged into that. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So um, last year, we had a 160 plus million ministers of the gospel all over the world who joined us for the global classroom. And this year, we're having over 200 million, right? 200 million ministers of the gospel. That's amazing. By tomorrow, we'll give you um, the, the figures of the participation all over the world. So it makes sense that we're discussing ministry, the ministry of the gospel, the ministry of the gospel. But it begins, ministry begins with the message. It begins with the message. Think about it. Jesus said, God sent him. Sent him to do what? First, he had to take a message to the world. The first thing was not to die. See? He didn't just come into the world and die. The first thing was to bring us a message from God. And that's exactly what the Bible says. I'm going to read to you. Um, let's take three portions of the Bible. The first one is in Matthew's Gospel. They're, they're related. They're related, but I just want you to observe something. In St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number four and verse number 23, the Bible says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. He went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching. What was he teaching about? What was he preaching about? It says the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What's that? Authenticating his message. Proven his message of the kingdom with the healings, with the miracles. Now go to the same book, chapter 9 and verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Very much like what we just read in chapter 4. But it's not a repetition. Just telling us what he was about doing. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. crucial because the kingdom offers eternal life and you are a messenger of eternal life so you're going out you're telling the world Jesus gives you eternal life imagine that somebody asks you what's eternal life what, what, what does that mean what are you going to say so you have to know what it is you have to know what the scriptures tell us about eternal life. You have to give attention to it because it is a fundamental blessing of the gospel. Fundamental. 
So you're dealing with a priority here. These things that I'm going to share with you, which the first one I already mentioned to you, are things that I, I gave serious attention to. I thought that if they were fundamental in the kingdom and I was sent to preach them, it was important for me to know them. I should know them. I should so know them. So eternal life is number one. And what is eternal life? I'll give you two simple statements that will help you. And if you've been participating in our program, your love world special, specials, you, you would have received some understanding of this. Two statements. The first one is eternal life is the life and nature of God. It is the term that describes the life and nature of God. That in itself is not a definition. It just expresses to you what kind of life it is. It just expresses that when you say eternal life, you are referring to a life that's different from others. It is the life and nature of God. But the second statement is more of a definition than the first one. See, it is the organic and existential attributes of deity. You gotta write that down because of its importance. There are so many gods that people refer to, so many deities. They talk about they've got um, this god and then the other god. They represent them in so many different ways. But there are two key things in this definition that makes it different. So if we're going to know who is God, then we must examine organic and existential attributes of deity. And I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking at the moment uh, of the, uh, of Zeus in Greek mythology and all the interesting things they, they have about Zeus. I'm thinking, so where is Zeus? Where is Zeus? Can Zeus prove himself? Where is Zeus? Can Zeus prove himself today? If we analyze the organic and existential attributes of deity, are we going to find Zeus? You're not going to find him. See, you're not going to find him. What about all the other gods? Can they, do they have these attributes? Eternal life is the life that God declared of himself in scripture to have us understand the difference between him and all others that may be called gods. Eternal life. So that definition is 
so important. You have to have it. You have to know it. So you're going to have to learn the difference. And then, of course, if you get to the Pastor Chris Digital Library and find the material, you would find um, the message where I um, expatiated on this much farther. But let's look at the scriptures and what the word tells us. St. John's Gospel begins with chapter 6 and verse number 47, the words of Jesus. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's remarkable. Jesus says, verily, that means most assuredly, I say unto you, he that believes on me has everlasting life, has everlasting life. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. That's amazing. Then we go to chapter 17, St. John's Gospel. We're going to read from verse 1 into verse 3. I want you to make an observation. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. Jesus is praying here. He's praying. Look at verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. Wow. Wow. What confidence Jesus had. Look what is stated. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. That he shall give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. That Jesus. He says that he, Jesus, shall give eternal life. So as many as thou hast given him. Jesus gives eternal life. He can give it. Wow. <laughs> you have to have it to be able to give it. Verse 3. And this is life eternal. I love Jesus. Hear how he gives it to us. And this is life eternal. That they might know thee. He's praying to the father. Remember he's talking to God. He's praying. He says and this is life eternal. That they might know thee. The only true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is life eternal. To know God. And Jesus Christ. You can't have one without the other. You see, he, he didn't say that they might know thee, the only true God, and stop there. No. And Jesus Christ. You got to know Jesus Christ. This is eternal life. You see it? He says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Amazing. Go to first epistle of St. John, chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested. This is extraordinary. The life was manifested and we have seen it. John is writing something that's pretty unusual. You, you can't just find this in human writings. How can somebody, how can somebody claim to have seen life? He's not talking about experiencing his life, you know, like an everyday experience of human life. He says the life was manifested. Life showed up. And he says, we have seen it. 
This is the John who told us who this life was. We're going to see it. It says, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Blessed be God. Oh, hallelujah. Amazing. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How big this is. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin, the reward of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God gives eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now here, here's another big one. First epistle of St. John again. In chapter 5, we're going to read from verse 11. And this is the record. That God had given to us eternal life. <laughs> I want you to observe the tenses. He says, and this is the record. This is the testimony. This is the witness. That God has given to us. He doesn't say that God is going to give us. It's not a promise. You see, it's not a promise. It's not something we're hoping to get. He says that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Wow. Look at the next verse. He that had the son... At life. And he that had not the Son of God had not life. Let's read again from the NIV, the New International Version. And this is the testimony. See, that's the, the, the word you saw as record in the King James a moment ago. This is, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. I want you to understand. It says this is the testimony. It's a test. God has testified that he has done it. He has done it. You can't ask him for what he's already done. You act on it. He's testified. Look at it. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. This is the testimony. This is the testimony of God. Okay, let's read from the ninth verse so I bring you in properly so you see it. Look at it. He says, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Look at the next verse. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Period. 
What life? The eternal life we're talking about. Which is the organic and existential attributes of deity. The life and nature of God. This is what Jesus brought to the world. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it to the full. He came that men may have life, this life. You have biological life from where you got plant life, animal life. Yes. The different kinds of life. There's human life. But there is the divine life. The life and nature of God. That's what Jesus made available. He brought it to the world. He brought it to the world. It's the message of the kingdom of God. He offers eternal life in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. He offers it freely. That's why it's called gospel. You don't have to pay anything. It's in his son. He says, anyone who has the son has this life. So you're going to have eternal life, you're going to have the son. Hallelujah. What's you reading it? Let's go back to verse 12. We're going to read from verse 12 into 13. He who has the son has life. What a statement. What a statement. He who has the son has life. He didn't say he who has the son shall have life. No, he who has the son has life. This is God's testimony. If you have Jesus Christ, you have life. You have it. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to feel like you got it. He says you have it. It's God's testimony. He says if you don't accept his testimony, then you've made God a liar. Because he has testified that eternal life is in his son. And that if you have his son, you have eternal life. You have to accept his testimony. God cannot lie. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. And look at the next verse. You're going to love it. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Glory be to God. If you believe on the name of the son of God, he says, I write to you that you may know I want you to know that you have eternal life. I want you to know. The purpose of this writing is that you may know that you have eternal life. Oh boy. How powerful this is. There are two beautiful portions of the Bible by this same writer, John. That I'm going to draw your attention to. But let's look at that 13th verse one more time. Just look at it one more time. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? His name is Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not in the future. Not when you get to heaven. Know that you have it. You have it now. You have eternal life. When are you going to live it? So I'm going to re read to you these two beautiful portions of the Bible. The first one is in St. John's Gospel, chapter 20. And you go to verse... 25. Well, let me just shorten it and, and go straight to verse 30. Let's read from verse 30. Oh, you'd love this. And many, many other signs 
truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John says, see, he's writing to us his gospel. And he tells us so many miracles. He reports many miracles to us in his writing. Then he says, and many other signs, miraculous signs, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that he might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. You know, many years as I took the gospel to different places to preach and crusades, I often would tell them, I'll give them this message. I would say, the reason for sharing with you today, our purpose for coming to you, and our purpose for these miracles that you've seen tonight, often I'll preach in the night time. I say, it's that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, he might have life through his name. And I give an altar call. The purpose was that they might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Christ means the Son of God. And he just told you. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. When Jesus declared that he was the Christ, they said that's blasphemy. Because Christ means Son of God. Son of God means God in human flesh. And that's too much for the religious mind. They said, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, yes. They said, blasphemy. Because you are a man and you have made yourself God. Because Christ is God in the flesh. You see that? But John says, I've written these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Extraordinary, extraordinary. You know, you, you, you read these words, you meditate on them, you will be inspired. You will be stared as a minister of the gospel. You cannot read these words and be ordinary. It's impossible. It's impossible. You read this and you're transformed forever. These words. Let me read you some more. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. He tells us how to respond to this. Look what he says. Likewise. Now this is Paul writing. This is Paul writing now. We've just been reading John and we read one from Paul. Same, same chapter. But the 23rd verse was what we read earlier. But now look at this 11th verse. Likewise. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But alive unto God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is amazing. Alive to God. Oh, wow. He says, remember, we read what he told us. I write to you that you may know that you have eternal life. He says, I want you to know that you have eternal life. So I have eternal life. Now, Paul is telling us, from this book of Romans, he says, regard yourself, reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God. I'm alive to God. You see, this is another kind of life. This is God's kind of life. I'm alive to God. Wow. I'm alive to God. It says, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm alive to God. So eternal life is a life that you live right now. 
You got it right now. You've got it right now. You got to believe it. You got it right now. It's not coming. You got it already. You got it already. I want to read you something there is here in 2 Timothy. Oh boy. It's too powerful. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I'm, I'm reading from verse 8. Where I want to go is a little farther, but we have to get in properly. Be not thou therefore, he's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, who at the time was pastor in the church at Ephesus. Hear what he says to him. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who had saved us, God who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Oh boy, oh boy, I really have to control myself to, to be able to share this with you. Oh boy, who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Look at the next verse. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath... Look at that. Who hath abolished death. And had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is extraordinary. Extraordinary. There's no other way of explaining it apart from what he already said. It's clear. He has abolished death. He's not going to. He's done it. Abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I wish I was majoring on this today because just so much to tell you. And unless we accept this truth, this reality, we'll never live it. It's the truth of his word. He's unveiled life and immortality. The generation of the church that believes this is the generation that will experience the rapture. Yes. The church has to come to this knowledge of the truth. That Christ truly brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We haven't, we haven't had it preached much. Why? Because most don't believe it. Most don't understand it. Many have a... They can't accept it. They, they can't believe it. Why? Why can't they believe it? Because they look at experiences and history. Not because they know better than what it says. Experiences and history. They forget that the gospel 
has something to say about the future. It's got a message for today and tomorrow. What life do you have today? Question. What did Jesus come to do? What did Jesus come to do? Have you ever thought about it? What did Jesus come to do? What was his purpose? Why did he come? And when you state his purpose for coming, ask yourself, did he accomplish it? Or is he still trying to do it? Is he still trying to accomplish it? Well, the Bible says he's finished. And when he finished, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down. So he finished. He accomplished it. He made life and immortality available through the gospel and sat down. It's done. It's done. He never has to do anything more about you having life and immortality. He doesn't have to do anything anymore. He's already done it. He gave it to you. He gave it to you. You know, many have spoken defeat, death, so long. It's hard to think what life is. That's why I could give you a definition of eternal life. Did you ever hear anybody, anybody ever gave you the definition of eternal life? Anybody ever gave it to you? Nobody thought about it. But he's given it to us. He's given it to us. We have it. We have that life today. We live that life today. We've got it. Blessed be God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amazing. Amazing. He's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Through the gospel. That's what he's about. That's what he's about. He, he gave it to us. Now, in first epistle of St. John, chapter 4, in verse 17, look what the Bible tells us. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, that's it. As he is, question how is he? Since he is the reflection, all right? So how, how is he? As he is, so are we in this world, not when we get to heaven. How is he? How is Jesus? You have to consciously understand the gospel. You have to come to terms with what the word actually tells you. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? If I'm a minister of the gospel, I've got to know what the gospel is. What is the news? What is the good news? What is the news? What is it about? Okay, so let me take you to number two, right? Number two. I, I, I've at least provided you some food for thought. So you're going to have to think through what I shared with you and then go into the Bible, ransack the, the verses, go everywhere in the, in the book and find what the word tells you about eternal life and live it. We have eternal life now. See, imagine if the church got a hold of this message many years ago and we raised our kids to think like that and to talk like that. Think what the church would have been like today. Remember, spiritual power is activated first by acknowledgement and secondly, declaration. If you don't acknowledge it, it can't work. You acknowledge it and declare it.
That's how you activate spiritual power. So if there's power in this truth, then God's people would have had to have acknowledged it and have been declaring it. It should be in the consciousness of your daily language. You know, we, 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 we like to be, uh, maybe to be humble and um, we misunderstand humility. So someone says to you, oh, you really have power. And you might say, I don't have. And you might say, only Jesus has. But you're wrong. He says, I gave you power. Amen. He gave you power. How can you, how can you deny what he gave you? Yes. But why do many do it? Because they want to sound humble. They don't want others to accuse them of pride. So they say, well, I don't have any, I don't have any power. No, I have power. I have power. Oh, I'm, I'm full of power. Didn't he, didn't he give us the Holy Ghost? Yes, he did. He gave us power, so we have power. I'm full of power. Hallelujah. Look at how Jesus spoke. Jesus said, in St. John's Gospel, when you read in, in the 26th verse of the 5th chapter, Let's look at it. We got to talk like Jesus. For as the father had life in himself, so had he. So had he given to the son to have life in himself. Who's going to talk like that? You, you talk like that? And those around you look, hey, you're getting proud now. He says, as the father had life in himself, so had he given to the son to have life in himself. Didn't he just tell us as he is? So are we in this world? How is he? He's full of life. If you were talking like this, there will never be uh, some tumor in the body and then some, some, some of these problems that people suffer with. You be full of life and expressing life. Do you know who we are? Can I explain a little bit to you who we are? If I said to you, who is Jesus? You'd say, Jesus is the son of God. Correct. But there's something more. What he tells us in St. John's gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14. See what it says. The word was made flesh, supposed to read, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God. So look at verse 1. Same book, same chapter. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. All right. Now, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus Christ is the word of God made flesh. Or the word of God become flesh. Okay. So he's the living word. That's easy. We can accept that. But what does the Bible say about us? Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's read verse 23. Being born again. <laughs> Not of corruptible seed. But of incorruptible. By the word of God. Which liveth and abideth forever. I want you to look at that again. Being born again. He's, he's talking about us now. Born again. Not of corruptible seed. But of incorruptible. By the word of God. Which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ. Is the logos of God. The word of God. 
become flesh. That word that became flesh gave birth to us. So what are we? That means you are God's word in the flesh. Oh, Pastor Chris, hold on, hold on. These are not conjectures. Just relax. Just relax. A dog gives birth to dogs. A cat gives birth to cats. So what does the word of God give birth to? The word. That should be simple. This is the reason he gave us the word. So we can have our minds. Influenced. Changed. To the thinking of God. And have his vocabulary. In our tongues. And speak his language. So we talk God's talk. See. We're supposed to be trained. Church is the place where we train God's people to talk God's talk. That's what you're supposed to do in your church. So the church is God's family. And we're raising our kids to talk God's language. Talk God's talk. They grow up talking God's talk. If you will talk God's talk, you're going to live God's life. As a result of it. Well, let me show you scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3. What does the Bible say? You're going to love this. I'm reading. I'm going to read to you from verse 1. Let's just read from verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? Ye are... Our epistle. What's epistle? Letter. Letter. Message. A message. One of the synonyms for Logos is message. See. You are our epistle. Written in our hearts. Known and read of all men. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, Paul. That's nice. Let's keep reading. Next one. For as much as he are, <laughs> look at this, for as much as he are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of a living God, not in tables of stone, but fleshy tables of the heart. What? You are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ? Jesus Christ was manifestly declared to be the epistle of God. He was the epistle of God. He was the message of God. He was the word of God. The message of God sent to the world. To be read. He was manifested in the flesh. You looked at him and this was the word of God. When he spoke, it was God's word. When he acted, it was God's word. When he healed, it was God's word. Everything he did was the manifestation of the word of God in flesh. He was manifestly declared to be the word of God. In the flesh. Now he says you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. If you are the message of Christ. It means you are the message of God. If you are the epistle of Christ. You are the epistle of God. If you are the word of Christ. Which that means. Then you are the word of God. Hallelujah. So how are you going to live your life? That's why he gave you his written word. So you can learn his language and talk his language. And the necessary result of that is an outflow of the God life. That will be your experience every day. The God life. That will be your experience. There will be no defeat in your life. You'll be an absolute victor. Doesn't matter who your adversaries are. Doesn't matter what circumstances you find yourself in. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. So you always look beyond the circumstances. 
Because you are above this world. You have a life that's divine. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Oh, Caro Segla Argantos Cobra Belegis. Can I explain a little bit on what, what do you mean Christ in you? Do you suppose that Christ is sitting somewhere, somewhere inside your body? Do you suppose that somehow, somewhere in your spirit, he is sitting somewhere in there? Is that what you think? No, that's not what he means. He tells us, Aya Kaba He says, You are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You are the milos, the milos, the members of Christ. You are his feet, you are his hands. He says, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Oh. Let me show you something more. Where we were just reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at the fifth verse. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. What? Do you know what he's saying? This man, Paul, is writing, of course, as inspired by the Holy Ghost, but this was also his experience of the gospel. This was the life that he was writing. This was his life. If it was possible for Paul, why wouldn't it be possible for us? Not that we are sufficient of our errors to think anything as of our errors, but our sufficiencies of God. Wow. My sufficiency is of God. My ability, He can notice. My efficiency. That means the ability of God is working in me. He's writing to the Corinthians here. To the Philippians. He said to them, I can do all things through Christ. Who strengthens, energizes me. I can do all things. How could he have such mentality? Because he understood what Christ meant. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He understood it. He understood it. It was a oneness with Christ, a oneness with deity. He was no longer of himself. He had become one with Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He had come to that understanding. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Have I entered number two? I thought I, I, I said number two, and then uh, I, I haven't got into number two. Okay, let's go into number two. Oh, wow. Number two. Oh, I love this. <clears throat> In fact, what I just said now is really a good point to enter number two. Really a good point. Number two is, Remember, we're talking about three fundamental blessings of the gospel. And the first one we said is eternal life. Number two is fellowship with God. It is the most extraordinary thing. Oh. This is amazing. You know, the angels... 
as far as we know, will live forever. But the life they have is not the definition of eternal life that I gave you. They just live. To have this kind of life, you must have this number two. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. Let's read certain scriptures. We'll begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We were called unto the fellowship of his son. We were brought into fellowship. We were called into fellowship with Jesus Christ, the son of God. Fellowship with his son. That's amazing. We have become associates with him. We have become sharers with him. In fact, the Bible tells us he brought us into such a relationship with him that we are joint heirs with him. Joint heirs with Christ. Fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's something about this fellowship that is extraordinary. And I'm going to show it to you in a moment. It, this, is, this is huge. But let's read in, in, in first epistle of St. John, chapter 1. We're going to read verse number 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, glory be to God. Oh. He is saying here that we have become members of the heavenly pantheon. We have become members of the heavenly pantheon. This is exactly what John is saying here. He said, truly our fellowship, our comradeship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are in fellowship with him. He's brought us into this heavenly pantheon. What? Without going into details, let me just take you to a verse of the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And begin with verse 4. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And I saw thrones. And they sat upon them. Huh? <laughs> I, I said, I, I'm just going to read to you. I won't, I won't go into details. But just in case you, you think um, something was missing there, or you don't know if there was, let's read from verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Okay, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. Suddenly, it's like, uh, where's the context? Who are they, they sat upon them? Right? Okay. 
You, you would have had to be reading from chapter 19 and all that. But here's the beautiful thing. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. And which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their in hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Thrones. Okay, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read just a few verses from verse 1. Well, your minister, so remember, so if I'm reading many, many verses, don't say he was reading too many verses today. Your minister, so just write them down. Yeah. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the, the saints? He says, don't take one another to court. You can take other people to court, but not your brothers and sisters. Do you not know? Look at that. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Look at the next thing. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? We shall judge angels? I told you. Think who we really are. Think who we really are. Kaba rabagasatalamahi. Hey, glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God. Hallelujah. In fellowship with him. Wow. In, in 2 Peter, chapter 1, we read from verse 3 into verse 4. According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Hi. Did you just see that? He hath given unto us. His divine power hath given unto us. Not shall give. It's not a promise. He's already done it. Hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. I wish I was, I wish I was preaching on that one. Amazing. But I, I'm, I'm actually trying to take you to verse 4. That's where we're going. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. Associates of the God kind. Associates of the God kind. He takes the word partakers from the same word that reads fellowship. Koinonia. So he brought us into fellowship with himself. There is the legal aspect of it. Which is wonderful. So. We are associates of the God kind. That's beautiful. But I want to show you something deeper. Than. This relationship where we're brought into God's class, where we're made friends with God. It says, being therefore justified by faith, we are at peace with God. There's a oneness now through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. That's great. But here is the most significant aspect of this fellowship with God. St. John's Gospel, chapter 14. Ah. You know, some things are just too, too huge, too big. Too big. Let me start reading to you from verse 10. 
You've got to discover this in your life. It has to become your personal experience of God. Personal experience of God. Now, you, you, you're not going to experience it by, by asking him to make it happen. It's fulfilled in Christ when you receive the Holy Ghost. Watch this now. Maybe we should read it from, from the, the full story, okay? Let's read it from the full story. Um, let's take it from verse 5. You know, Jesus was telling his disciples, I'm, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now come back and so on. Then Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way. <laughs> he says, we, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? See, I, I want you to understand. Look at the language of God. How God thinks. That's the way Jesus thought. And that's the way we are to think. Thomas is thinking in the flesh. Jesus is thinking in the spirit. Thomas is saying, Master, you said you're going. And, and, and you know, when Jesus said, I'm going away, then Jesus says, you know the way. And Thomas just blotted out, Master, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's thinking in the flesh. Where do we pass? How do we go? Where's the location? Jesus said unto him, I am the way. What an answer. What an answer. If you're in the flesh, you'll be confused. You'll be more confused because he says, I am the way. You know? Jesus is speaking in the spirit. I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Wow. That's wonderful. Look at the next verse. If he had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and I've seen him. See, he, he, he didn't say uh, um, from henceforth, I'm going to try to introduce him to you. He says, you know him. Hallelujah. Wow. This is the way he wants you to think. He doesn't want you arguing and say, uh, uh, master, I, I can't really say I know him. No, don't go in the flesh. Go in the spirit. He says, you know him. Then you say, yes, sir, I know him. I know him. Blessed be God. I know him. If you say, I know him, I know him. I know him. Thank you, Lord. I know him. He says, don't make God a liar. He says, you know him. Doesn't he know that you're trying to reason in the flesh and you're thinking, where is he? Show us the father. Oh, you know him. Yes. Then suddenly the knowledge of God wears up in your spirit. Now you know the truth. He told you who he is. The way. The truth. The life. What he tells you is truth. If he says you know him, that's the truth. Don't think in the flesh. He says, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that brothers to glory and virtue. So, do I have all things? Yes. Don't say, but um, uh, I, I am especially in need of. You are not in need of. You have everything. You don't have. You don't have the consciousness of need. You have the consciousness of supply. Say, I have the consciousness of supply. Glory be to God. Amen. A consciousness of supply. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Glory be to God. All right, I was reading something to you. I want you to see it. So go back to St. John's Gospel, chapter 14. Or in verse 10, right? Did we get to verse 10 already? What was the last verse we read? Seven? Okay, go back to seven then. If he had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth you know him, and I've seen him. 
Philip, <laughs> they're, not, they're not done yet. They're not satisfied. Philip said unto him, see, we can understand their trouble. As at this time, they hadn't received the Holy Ghost. They didn't have that teacher in them. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and then we'll stop disturbing you. <laughs> That's exactly, you look at it. It says, and that, it suffices us. We'll be, we'll be okay. We'll be satisfied. We'll stop asking you questions. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that had seen me had seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? What? Did you just see what Jesus said? That's amazing. That's an extraordinary statement. Look at the next one. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Oh boy. Don't you believe that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. In other words, I'm not speaking out of myself, by myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. If you understand the scripture, you have... How do I put it for you? Ministry is 100% settled. The understanding of the scripture. Everything is settled. I think that if what I just told you is true, you better want to read the scripture again. I'm sure you want us to read it again. Let's read it again. It says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. What? Hey, let's, let's, let's go again. Don't you believe that I Okay, it's very simple. When you were born again, you were born first. You were born into Christ. Do you remember that? You were born into Christ. That's what the Bible tells the Holy Ghost came upon you. See, and immersed you. The Bible says by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. You were immersed into Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So you were baptized into Christ. You were in Christ. Then the next experience, you received the Holy Ghost. When you received the Holy Spirit to live in you, he came into you. John puts it this way, being in God and God in you. So when you were born again, you were born into God. I am in the Father. And when you received the Holy Spirit, the Father came into you. You see it? When Jesus talked about the Father, look at it again. Let's look at that scripture one more time. Look at it again. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Amen. Who's the Father that dwelleth in me? Who's Jesus referring to? The Holy Spirit. Amen. He talked about the Father in heaven. He looked up to heaven and said, Father. He taught them in prayer. He says, he said, our father, which art in heaven. In referring to the Holy Spirit, he called him the father that dwells in me. Remember that Jesus was called a child of the Holy Ghost. 
So when you receive the Holy Spirit to live in you, you receive your Father that dwells in you. My Father that dwells in me. He doeth the works. He performs the works. You have to have this consciousness. Your Father lives in you. Jesus had this consciousness. You got to have it too. You got to have it too. My Father lives in me. Then you stop seeing the Holy Ghost like junior God. He's not junior. No, he's your father. The Holy Spirit is your father. Remember, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Born of which spirit? The Holy Ghost. If you're born of the Holy Ghost, that means he's your father. Maybe you never had this consciousness that the Holy Spirit was your father. Well, you just got it today. And with that understanding, you find everything falls into place. Everything. He orchestrates the circumstances of my life. You see, every day of my life is on plan. By my father that lives in me. I don't live a life that is accidental. No. No day is an accident. No day comes without a plan. My father has it all planned out. And every day I'm a success. I'm a victor. I'm prosperous. Everything is taken care of in abundance. I have abundant supply. I call it an extraordinary latitude for amplitude. Latitude for amplitude. Think about it. I have latitude for amplitude. That means an allowance for as great as I want. Hallelujah. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Copious abundance. It's flowing. He says, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the epignosis of him that had called us to glory and virtue. He not only called us, he brought us in. What else should I tell you? I can speak from now till Saturday night. And when we're done Saturday night, I'll still have so much to say. I can't even go into the third one now. I just noticed it appears I, I, I probably have been speaking for uh, more than an hour now. Going to, in 15 minutes, it'll probably be two hours. Okay. Okay. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So I, I'm going to... I'm going to round off this part. I'll leave um, the half of, half of number two and number three for tomorrow. Okay, because we haven't done but just half of what we want to say in number two. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Glory be to God.